It's another edition of Time About the Movies. Today we're taking a look at the films of March 8th, 1996. We got nine movies to look at today, so I'm not going to waste any more time. Let's just jump on into it, and we'll start off with the biggest new release of the weekend, which was uh, Nathan Lane and Robin Williams starring in The Birdcage. The Birdcage is, of course, a remake of the French-Italian comedy La Caja Fou from the 1970s, which was actually turned into a musical. I've never seen the original La Caja Fou. I've only seen clips of it, and it looks pretty funny. Like, it looks like it could be a really funny movie, but this one definitely looks like a modernized take of that film, directed by Mike Nichols of The Graduate fame. Elaine May is the writer of this. Uh, this is actually the first script she ever solely wrote since Ishtar, the infamous flop with Dustin Hoffman and Warren Beatty from 1987, so... Nine years after that movie nearly killed her career, she's back again, and what a way to come back on this one as the solo writer on here. But um, this is a pretty funny movie. Robin Williams is very good here, so is Nathan Lane. You got Gene Hackman and Diane Weist in here. They have a lot of good comedy in this. Uh, Calista Flockhart, pre Alan McBeal, Hank Azaria off The Simpsons, Christine Baranski's also in here. They have a really good cast here, and there's a lot of memorable, funny moments in this movie. It's a very slick very hilarious comedy. It's not afraid to be what it is. And it's just so unique and so incredibly funny. Like, it's a funny comedy that you look at. And you don't mind the fact that this is basically a straight-up gay comedy. And you can watch it even if you're not gay, even if, you're, even if you're not straight. You can still watch this movie and find so much to really admire about it. There's just so much about it that works because of the writing, because of the direction, because of the work of the amazing cast in this film. It's a really fantastic movie. It's a hilarious film. It was a huge hit when it came out, and you can definitely see why. It's still one of the most beloved comedies of Robin Williams' career almost 30 years later. And again, you can definitely see why. There's just so much about it that's so memorable, so unique, so funny. Even if you've never seen the original films, uh, the, uh, the original La Caja Full trilogy, you can still find a lot here to really enjoy about this film. I can't recommend this movie enough. The Birdcage, fantastic film. Can't recommend that one enough. So... With that said, let's move on to the next movie, and that is Homeward Bound 2, Lost in San Francisco. I mean, did you see the first Homeward Bound? Then you're probably going to like this one. It's pretty much the same movie. It's just replaced the wilderness elements from the first movie and replaced it with San Francisco. It's pretty much the same movie as the first film, as well as kind of taming down the more intense moments. And again, pretty much the same movie as the first film, and... Is that a bad thing? Not really. I mean, there's still a lot of fun elements to the movie that I can still enjoy, mostly for nostalgia's sake. This is one of those sequels that I saw a lot more than I saw the original film. I saw this one first before I saw the original Homeward Bound and before I saw The Incredible Journey, the film from the 70s, I believe? 60s, 70s, around... Is that was based off the, other pre the previous film in the series. And like Back to the Future 2, Batman Forever, among others. And while Homeward Bound 2 certainly is a retread of the first movie... It definitely still has a lot of redeemable elements to it. I think that works still work very well here. The voice work overall is still very solid in here. The comedy and the action can be fun. It still manages to enter be entertaining for a good majority of the film. It kind of reminds me of Beethoven's second in a way. It's definitely the, a lot of the same elements from the first movie again, but there are still a lot of fun moments in that film that you can still enjoy, even if you think it's just a retread of the first movie. This is literally a retread of the first Homeward Bound movie, and the original is b the better film, the Homeward Bound, The Incredible Journey. This is still a fun film. If you like the first one, you'll probably like the second one, just like I did. So, that's pretty much all I got for you on that one. A quick one on that one, Homeward Bound 2, Lost in San Francisco. Uh, we have another sequel up next, and that is Hellraiser Bloodline. See, Hellraiser Bloodlight did this before Jason X made it cool. Actually, Jason X didn't make it cool. It was actually... Okay, it wasn't bad, bad, but it was still not a good movie whatsoever. But Hellraiser Bloodline, this is the last film to be released in the Hellraiser series that actually went to theaters. And it had a troubled production history. Of course, you see the name Alan Smithy there. If you know the story of Adam, Alan Smithy, it was an alias back then used by directors who wanted to go uncredited, basically acknowledging that their movies that they're in... that involved in are not very good uh the director left the production when distributor miramax demanded new scenes be shot uh it was it was completed by um uh joe chappelle i, I was trying to find the name for the, this guy uh joe chappelle came in to finish it the new scenes and reshoots changed several characters relationships gave the film a happy ending 
introduced Pinhead way too early. They cut 25 minutes of the film, and the movie was just a mess on so many levels, so much so that it was also not screened for critics, which should tell you everything you need to know about this movie. It's just like... This was really the this was really the end of the road for for the theatrical run of these Hellraiser movies. They kept getting worse and worse with every film, and uh, this was also the last one that Clive Barker was involved in until the 2022 reboot came out, which I saw a little bit of the 2022 reboot. I thought that was actually pretty interesting, but I haven't seen the whole thing, so I can't really comment on that one too much. But um, this is really about as bad as you could possibly get. This is a film that's not that enjoyable. As much as Doug Bradley puts his effort into this, it's still not an enjoyable movie. It's a lackluster installment, the, one of the last ones of the series with him involved. And um, Actually, no, I don't think he is. I need to do some research. Give me one second. Well, that tells you everything I know about this series. Apparently, I thought Doug Bradley didn't come back after this one, but no, he was in most of the original, in the Hellraiser movies, including the director video sequel, so, I mean, more power to him. He liked doing these movies. I mean, Warwick Davis did so many of the Leprechaun movies that weren't very good and went director video, and those turned into, out to be good. But he probably made a good payday, and he probably had a good time making those films, so who am I to judge? But um, uh, what was I even talking about? Hellraiser Bloodline. Just not a very good movie. It's a very bad film. Not a very is it just because of everything that was going on behind the scenes? Uh, that's pretty much all I got for you in that one. So let's move on to the next movie, and that is If Lucy Fell. Yeah, remember Eric Schaefer? No one. Yeah, I have no idea who this guy is, but apparently when this movie came out, he was kind of a big deal. I mean. They were setting this guy up to be the next big movie star, the next big entertainer, because he had a TV show at the time that actually followed The Simpsons back in 1995, but it unfortunately got canceled after one season. And uh, this movie, he put a lot of money into this. They get, Sony gave him $3.5 million to make this movie, and um, uh, nothing ever came out of this guy. I mean, this movie came out, and he kind of disappeared after that. And honestly, this movie... Doesn't seem like it has a whole lot of promise to it, honestly, despite the fact that it has a pretty decent cast to it. Uh, Sarah Jessica Parker, Elle McPherson, Ben Stiller, James Rebhorn, Scarlett Johansson, one of her early film roles. But other than that, it just looks like a mediocre, bland romantic comedy. Nothing too crazy, nothing too interesting, and uh, nothing really all that exciting, honestly. So, quick one on that one. Let's move on to the next movie, the, probably the best movie that came out this weekend overall, and that is The Coen Brothers, Fargo. What more do I even need to say about Fargo? It's one of my favorite movies of all time. One of my favorite Coen Brothers movies of all time. Francis McDormand, fantastic in this movie, playing Marge Gunderson. Deserved the Academy Award. This movie deserved to win Best Picture. I don't care what anybody says. You know, The English Patient may have been a good movie, but I'm sorry. This was the best, one of the best films of 1996. It should have been the Best Picture winner. I don't care what anybody says. I prefer this movie over The English Patient. I think it is the best movie of the one of the best movies of the year and really i don't think i need to say any more about this movie it hasn't already been said it's a classic movie shot beautifully great cinematography by roger deakins the coen brothers giving you this great comedy the direction is very solid the cast is great mcdorman william h macy Stu buscemi peter stromare just so many quote memorable lines in this movie really do I need to say any more about it? It spawned a fantastic FX TV series, which is still going strong after all these years. And again, do I really need to say anything else about this movie? If you haven't seen Fargo, do yourself a favor and watch the damn movie. It's amazing. I can't recommend it enough. Fargo, I love this movie. So, uh, with that said, on to the next movie, and that is the re-release of Heavy Metal. Of course, Heavy Metal came out in 1981. This is produced by Ivan Reitman. It's funny, Ralph Bakshi always gets credit for this movie, but he always has to tell people, I didn't make Heavy Metal. That was Ivan Reitman. That was the Ghostbusters guy that made it. And uh, this came out in 1981. It was, a cult it was a cult hit for a long period of time. They actually re-released it in theaters this weekend in 1996 to prepare for the DVD, for the video release of the film, which actually sold over a million copies. It was very successful on home video. And uh, it's a very unique animated movie. It's a very unique film with science fiction and fantasy stories taken right out of the heavy metal magazine. Visually, sty visually stylishly, 
one of the most gorgeous looking animated movies you'll ever see. It is such a trip on so many levels. It features an amazing cast of people that some of them may you may not recognize, but some of them you will definitely recognize. Rodger Bumpus, Squidward from SpongeBob, Jackie Burroughs from Dilbert, John Candy, Joe Flaherty, uh, Eugene Levy's in here, Harold Ramis, uh, August Schellenberg, John Vernon. Just a, ph a phenomenal voice cast. Great music by Black Sabbath, Blue Oyster Cult, Sammy Hagar, Cheap Trick, Devo, Journey. Amazing soundtrack. Just it has left a long, long legacy in cult, in cult form. Like it's a film that really should have a re-release re in the same style of the Rocky Horror Picture Show. It's on that same level of a re-release type of film that could be seen at midnight screenings and would probably get a huge audience going into it. It's just an amazing, amazing film. Stylishly beautiful to look at. Some of the shorts don't work so well, but overall, you just have the time of your life because of how amazing the animation looks. It's amazing that this movie has held up after over 40 years. It's a fun movie, really stylishly gorgeous to look at. Another one I can't recommend enough, Heavy Metal. So, with that said, on to the next movie, and that is The Star Maker. Directed by the same man that did Cinema Paradiso. This is a film that basically kind of has one plot in general. You're following this photographer and all the various people that he comes across. And probably not the most engaging story, honestly, when you really think about it compared to Cinema Paradiso. Uh, but this is just me judging by the trailer alone. I haven't seen this movie, so I can't really say too much about it. He did make Cinema Paradiso, which is an amazing, amazing Italian film. But so... I'm willing to give it the benefit of a doubt if I ever get around to seeing this movie. Uh, there, pro there could be something there that maybe I'm just not seeing. Just from what I'm seeing from the trailer alone, I don't think it's really that interesting. But again, I got to watch the movie to see for myself. So that's a quick one right there. Uh, on to the next one. We have Chunking Express. Another one I haven't seen, so I can't really say too much about this. This film consists of two stories, told in sequence, each about a lovesick Hong Kong policeman mulling over his relationship with a woman. The first one features a cop obsessed with his breakup with a woman and his encounter with a mysterious drug smuggler. And the second one has a police officer roused from his gloom over the loss of his flight attendant girlfriend by the attentions of a quirky snack bar worker. And uh, like I said before, I don't really know too much about this because I haven't seen it, so... I know nothing about it, but, um, I mean, it has a following to it. It's been seen by some of some of the, one of the great films of all time, so maybe this is something that could be very interesting, but I don't know for sure. I haven't seen the film, so I can't really say too much about it. So that's uh, Chunking Express. Let's move on to the last movie that we have here, and that is Love Lessons. Another movie that Box Office Mojo gave the wrong title for. It's called All Things Fair, but uh, in Swedish it's called Lust och Fagring Stor. Literally, Great Lust and Beauty. And uh, that the clip there you saw pretty much kind of sums up the movie. It's a sexual relationship between a teacher and a 15-year-old student in southern Sweden during World War II. And I um, haven't seen the movie, but uh, we've seen many movies like this. And... Um, I don't know what to make of it. I mean, it got nominated for an Oscar for Best Foreign Language Film, so I guess there's that. Other than that, though, I'm not really sure about this movie overall. I didn't know anything about it before I did this, so... I got nothing else for you on that one. So that's All Things Fair, or Love Lessons, or whatever they want to call it. Great Lust and Beauty. So that wraps up this edition of Time About the Movies. Next time we meet, we'll have six more movies to look at, including Executive Decision, starring Kurt Russell and Steven Seagal. We also have Matt LeBlanc trying to make his big screen presence known after his work on Friends with the movie Ed. Spoiler alert, it doesn't work out well, but uh, we'll talk about that on the next one. We'll also talk about Too Much, uh, The Celluloid Closet, Land and Freedom, and, Tarantula, and Tarantella. So... We'll set tarantula but uh those are the six movies that we'll look at next time around but until then thank you very much for watching and if you want to see more videos like this please hit the playlist on the next page check out the previous episode and i'll see you guys tomorrow for another episode so thank you very much for watching i'll see you next time and until then as always take care <laughs>